and, and that pastor is already feeling restless wherever he or she is right now, wherever their family is, that pastor is already feeling in his heart that God is moving in him and he's wondering what God's about to do. And he is both excited for the future and he is feeling concerned about this. And it's probably, I have a feeling, um, I, I just wouldn't be surprised if you end up with a fresh new pastor. Uh, not somebody who's been around the block a few times. And so he hasn't really experienced this before. This is a new thing for him. And he's wondering what in the world is going on. And he is going through the process right now of submitting himself to Christ again and again on a daily basis. And you are beginning the process of praying for this pastor to show up. There will come a time when he comes and meets with you all, and you say, we want you to come be the pastor, and he says, yes, I will, and then chaos will break out in his life. His family and home will become... <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Don has done this. And there will be no peace... And it will be a tremendous weight, even if he is one town away and just has to drive here. It will disrupt everything about his life. If he, like us, has to sell a house and move children and figure out all of those logistics, it will be even more difficult. And there are tremendous periods of waiting and you need to be praying tremendously for this pastor. You need to be thinking not about how it affects you and the church to wait for the pastor to show up, but how it affects the pastor. Because uh, we're already all praying for you. No, you guys are going to need to be praying for them. Um, because, yeah, it really, I tell you what, we have... We, had, we have to sell our house. Here's an example. We, had to, we have to sell our house. And we prayed that God would sell our house before it even hit the market. But he didn't, so it's on the market. We said, that's okay. Let's pray that it sells before there's any showings because we don't want people in here. Matter of fact, Addie was praying that somebody from Texas would buy it sight unseen. I don't know why Texas, but whatever. Maybe because they're super rich there. I don't know. Anyway, well, that didn't happen. And so it's been shown, I don't know, eight or ten times. But we had an open house scheduled for yesterday, and we didn't want to do that, because that's four hours of not being there after tremendous preparation to get it ready for that. Well, that didn't happen. So we had an open house yesterday, and some of my family came and hung out here at the church. Some of you saw them here, and Hayden and I went and had to pick up a cargo trailer that we're going to need to move. So we went and did that, and... So then we're like, okay, that's fine, Lord, go ahead, you can do the open house if you really want, but we want an offer, you know, at the end of the open house. Well, that didn't happen, so um, we are waiting, and in the midst of the wait, it's chaotic, it's absolute, it's like, it's like waiting for the hurricane to pass. I mean, what else are you going to do? You've got to wait for the thing to get over. But in the midst of it, you've got to sit in the hurricane. And I tell you this for two reasons. For one, because I'd really like it if you'd pray for my family. Please don't stop yet praying for my family. Um, because I, I really don't know how all this is going to come together. And second, and maybe more importantly, because you're going to put another guy through that soon. I know you don't intend to. And I know it's what, what God is doing, and we just work with, with what God is doing. But in the midst of your own weight that you must carry just remember that this family that's coming in a matter of months I, it's, it's not gonna, the church is healthy and strong it's not going to take a long time we don't need a big you know two-year healing period or something like that or to figure out who we are before we can call somebody the church is healthy and strong and ready and the district agrees with me and pastor ev i don't know he might have already called gene um, but pastor Ev's going to start working with gene and with the board members on getting stuff going it's just it's just a matter of months um, but in the meantime, just keep in mind that that family is going to get blown around in ways that, unless you've done it, is just, it's really hard to explain, and, and uh, so be praying, especially if you bring somebody in from a ways away. It gets, the farther away they are, the harder it gets. So, anyway, but I thank you, Karen, for your testimony, because we are waiting for so many things right now, so many things.
And, uh, and I know that God is faithful, and I know that he'll take care of these things. And, I mean, you guys have heard some of my stories. I can tell you story after story after story of how God has just provided for our family in the most crazy and amazing ways, and I have absolutely no doubt that he's going to do it again. But I am human, and the stress is hard. So just remember that. Remember that for your next guy. And in the meantime, I confess to you this morning that I will not complete preaching through 1 John. And that's a bummer because it's one of my absolute favorites. The older I get, the more it matters to me, 1 John. It is so simple. It's just, it's just the most basic understanding of Christianity. It's so simple. If you can understand 1 John... And you've got to understand, this guy wrote to what he refers to as little children. I mean, he writes at like a kindergarten level. If you can grasp what he says in 1 John, I mean, the rest of this thing just snaps together. So I'm going to read for you all of chapter 3 this morning. It's not long. Feel free to read, a li- read along if you like. Remember, I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible. That's the version that I study out of. You don't have to have that one. There's lots of good ones. But if the words are different in yours, just remember that's why. Chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children. And we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is that it didn't know Him. Dear friends, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in himself purifies himself just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. Children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works, Everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we've come to know him. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. This is how we will know that we belong to the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. Dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, We have confidence before God and receive whatever we ask from Him because we keep His commands and do what's pleasing in His sight. Now this is His command, that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He commanded us. The one who keeps His commands remains in Him and He in Him. And the way we know that He remains in us is from the Spirit He has given us. Let's stop there and we'll pray. Lord, I thank You for this letter that You have preserved for us I pray that you will teach us, even with this really quick view today, you will teach us, that we'll hear your words. We thank you, Lord. Amen. This letter, as I have mentioned before, was probably the last that John wrote that we have. This was probably written after the gospel, after the revelation, and even after 2nd and 3rd John, this letter likely came along. It was likely the last recorded thing that John wrote for us, And as I mentioned, I love it because it is so simple. Our faith can get convoluted. It can become confusing. 
we can begin to think that there are things we must do or not do that have nothing to do with Christ. We begin to think that we need to look a certain way or act a certain way or handle certain things. We begin to think that God has a certain level of expectation for us for every last thing that we think or do or say or be and that if somehow or another we don't measure up or measure down to whatever it is He has claimed we must that somehow we're failing and we're displeasing to Him. And this little letter just puts that to bed. It just gets back to the basics of what Christianity is. And you know, if anybody ought to know, it ought to be John, who walked and talked with Christ. John spent more time with Jesus in the flesh than likely any other person ever has, and certainly more than any will. John tells us that he saw him and knows him and that he saw him in the flesh and knows him as a brother and friend and understands him to be God in the flesh. John gets it. And he makes it available for us. You know, Jesus knew that he was working with people who weren't necessarily the sharpest knives in the drawer. He understood that we're all kind of at least one salad short of a picnic. And so he's going to need to make sure that we can understand very simply what it means to know and follow God. Even the greatest theologian falls so short of the understanding of who God is and what he has done and what he's done for us that we're going to have to grasp this in the simplest possible form. And yet, as we talked last week, we tend to end up here either legalism or liberalism. I have told you that, that when John wrote this letter, he began by, by, by comforting us over the matter of missing the mark. We all miss the mark. He said, now listen, understand that as children of God, you're not allowed to miss the mark. But also understand that you're gonna. And that when you do, he said, you have an advocate, a, 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 a lawyer, that stands before Father God on your behalf, and He is your propitiation, your anointing sacrifice. He died in your place to take away the stain of sin so that you are justified, made just as if you never missed the mark, so that in the eyes of God, you are always hitting the mark straight on, He said. And He said that as you hit the mark straight on, you become a person of love, agape love. You follow the command of, of God. The new command. What is the new command? Well, what's the old command? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? Treat everybody how you want to be treated. That's the old command. The new command is bigger. Who cares how you want to be treated? Love everybody how Christ treated them. Pour yourself out for others. Withhold nothing. Well, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't require that, so give yourself away. Jesus said in John 13, it's recorded, Love one another as I have loved you. In the sacrificial way to save one another. And, John told us, that this love will be a maturing love. That you start as little children, so excited to just be set free from sin, and you become what he calls young men, victorious over the selfish carnal nature inside of you. And then you become what he calls old men, people who are happy to just be in the presence of God. But he said, watch out. There are antichrists. And remember, that doesn't mean opposite of Christ or people who are against Christ. It means substitutes for Christ. People who offer themselves or something else as a substitute for your Savior. Oh, you don't need that whole blood and guts on the cross thing. Just come with me to the football game and you'll feel great. Antichrist, substitute for. Oh, you don't need to worry about holiness and truth and whatnot. Just come with me to the spiritual life center and We'll make sure you feel better. Substitute for. Oh, the Bible's fine and all that, but I have this new book that I've written. This is what you really need to follow. Substitute. John said there are substitutes. Watch out for the substitutes. Accept no substitutes. 
because substitutes will lead you right here. Legalism, that is, I have designed a set of rules that I must follow so that I can be a Christian, so that I can measure up for God. i got to wear the right kind of shoes, and my shirt's got to be buttoned up to the top, and oh my gosh, Pastor Troy's not wearing a tie this morning. What are we going to do? Legalism, and legalism can work a lot of ways. We think of legalism in that strict sense, but legalism can also be, oh, I must accept everybody just as they are, right where they are, and say that they're good enough. Or liberalism. And this is really where we're going to dwell the most today as we move on, as you'll see, because liberalism comes from the mouth of Satan. Did God really say? Did God really say that? Gosh, that just, hmm just doesn't sit well with me. I, I, can't, I can't imagine that God could have possibly meant that. I just, hmm, that just, that just doesn't seem loving to me that he would say that. That moves us into liberalism. John is about, in John chapter 3, which is the middle chapter in the book and really the central theme of the book, and if you're going to memorize one chapter from any of John's writings besides the gospel, memorize John chapter 3. It's short and it's fantastic, and he tells us the simplicity of Christianity so easily. He said there are two things you must do. You'll see the first half of the chapter deals with one, the second half of the chapter deals with the other. There are two things, and that's what Christianity is all about about is just these two things you just take God at his word and you love one another that's it that's the whole thing that's it you don't even need me to stand up here and preach I mean you can't really fire me right now but still take him at his word like the song we sang he said it I believe it Take him at his word. Did God really say? Yes, as a matter of fact, he did, and I have it written down. Yeah, but science says, I don't care. I, this is, I, he wrote it down. Take him at his word. And love one another. And John even makes that easy for you, because John specifies who the one another are that we're supposed to be pouring ourselves out for initially, and that's us, the believers. Now, pour yourself out beyond that. He'll tell us, pour yourself out beyond that, but start right here. So easy. Start with the people you know and love already. That's it. That is the whole of your faith. Look up Micah 6, 8. You'll see it fits right in here. What has God required of you to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God? Take him at his word. Love one another. That's it. That's Christianity. This morning I want to break down the first section of the chapter which deals with the first of those topics, take him at his word. Let's look at it verse by verse for just a moment. Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away sins, and there is no sin in him. Everyone who remains in him does not sin, and everyone who sins has not seen or known him. This starts with verse 4, and it starts with a problem right away. Everyone who commits sin practices lawlessness. Wait a minute, I guess that's me. Okay, let's, let's take a little closer look here. That term commits could easily mean continues in. As a matter of fact, that's a, it's a really hard word to kind of put in place. Really, the word we should be focusing on is not the commits or continues in, but on the word practices. Do you know what it means to practice? My daughter had a third grade teacher, or maybe it was her fifth grade teacher. I think Lindsay, or I think Addie had this teacher as well. You remember the phrase, practice makes perfect? Well, she said, well, nobody's perfect. So practice makes progress. I always kind of wanted to slap that teacher personally, but I get what she's saying. I get what she's saying. That's all right. Practice makes progress. And she's right. The more we do something, the better we get at it, right? That's why we practice, well, I haven't practiced in a while, but how I used to practice trombone all the time or guitar, because the more you do it, the better you get at it. Wendy and I have been married 30 years. We've been practicing a long time. We must be really good by now. Nope, we got to keep practicing. The more you practice, the better you get. You guys have all seen this guy. Isn't this guy great? 
Love this guy. I can't remember his name. It's just not in my mind at the moment. He's jumped out of my mind this morning. He's from Turkey. He's an airsoft pistol shooter. He won the silver medal. Now, the thing about him is all of the other medalists are like young and strong and healthy. They spend all day in the gym and they show up to shoot and they're wearing special clothes, shooting clothes. And they've got special glasses where one eye is blanked out and the other eye has a bullseye on it. And they get up there to shoot their pistol and and they stand just right and they do the right thing and they scratch themselves in the right places first and then and they get up there to shoot. This guy, it's his turn, he walks out there, sticks his left hand in his pocket, picks the gun up off the table and goes boom and wins the silver medal. And they said, what is up with this guy? And then as soon as he was done, he was like, so where's the smoking section? What is up with this guy at 51 years old that he can come be a medalist when all these other people have dedicated their life to it? And he told the story. He said, well, see, a number of years ago, his wife was fooling around with another guy. And then she took his kids and split. And he was really frustrated and needed to get some angst out. And he had a buddy who did airsoft uh, pistol uh, target practice. And he said, why don't you come down and shoot? It always makes me feel better. So he did. He went down and started shooting. And you know what? He was pretty good at it. And it really did help to relieve the tension. So pretty soon he's doing it every day. He's going down there and shooting every day. He always shoots the same way. Left hand in his pocket, just kind of, that's pretty close. He didn't know any better. Nobody taught him. He just did it again and again and again and again and again and again and again for days and weeks and months and years until he was the best airsoft pistol shooter in the entire nation and clearly the second best in the world. Not because he had the right equipment, not because he had the right knowledge, not because he had the perfect coach, not because he was well financed by Nike or Adidas or Reebok, but because he practiced. Okay, back. Everyone who commits sin, continues in sin, practices lawlessness. These are people who say, I don't want the law of God. The law of God, take him at his word, love one another. That's the entire thing. The law of God, I don't want that. I don't want to measure up. I don't want to hit the mark. I want to do something else. I don't want to believe what the Word of God says and therefore love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength like it tells me in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I don't want to do that. I want to do something else. I want to believe something else. I want to cling to something else. Believe me, these people practice it. They study it. They work on it. They try it. They practice it. Whether they are like the the highest ranking uh, scientist who is anti-Bible or whether there's somebody out on the street shooting up with dope, they work on this every day to get better at it, to understand it better, to be more of it. Is that you? No. So you're not in this category. John is telling you about someone else. Those who continue in sin and practice lawlessness. Now understand, he says, sin is lawless. Remember that word for sin, hammer to you, missing the mark. Missing the mark is lawlessness. You're just choosing not to follow the law of God. You know that he was revealed so that he might take away sins so that you can be free from the penalty of. And there is no sin in him. That is, Christ always hits the mark. Everyone who remains in him does not sin. Uh Uh-oh, I guess I'm excluded because I sin. Wait a minute, back up to verse 4. Everyone who remains in in him does not miss the mark. You can't miss the mark if you're remaining in him. Because what did he tell us to do? Remain in him. So yeah, I, I make mistakes, and I got to go back to John, 1 John 1, 9, and confess my sins, which means agree with him, and be cleansed, and purified, and made righteous, and justified, just like I've never done it before. That's right, that's true, but I'm dwelling with him. Everyone who does, who remains in him, is hitting the mark. Do you want to know if you measure up right now to what God expects from you right now? Do you want to know if you're good enough for God right now? Are you remaining with Christ? Are you dwelling with him? Oh yeah, but yesterday I lost my cool and I swore at some guy on the freeway. And then I punched my kid because they wouldn't shut up. These guys didn't like the punch my kid part. They were fine with the (laughs) swear at the freeway. But then I I, I just, oh, I knew I was wrong. I just immediately knew I was wrong. And I went to God and I said, oh, I I, I shouldn't have done that. And, 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 And I'm so sorry for that because I want to be with you. I just want to be with you, and I know that if I act this way, I can't be with you. So will you forgive me? And he forgives you and cleanses you and justifies, and you're with him again. All right, 
then you hit the mark. It's that simple. Everyone who sins, that is, who continuously practices lawlessness, who isn't concerned about hitting the mark, well, they haven't seen him or know him. Even if they claim, oh, I'm a Christian. Really? Clearly you haven't seen or know him because you're not interested in hitting the mark. Understand? This is all leading towards something. Keep going. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. We can tell the difference. When we meet someone and we can see that they are dwelling with Christ, well, then they're doing it right. When we meet someone and we can tell that they are not dwelling with Christ, well, then they are not a Christian. No matter what they say, we can tell. We can tell just by looking at them. One person is dwelling with Christ, one person isn't. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. What are the devil's works? To get you away from Christ so that you won't dwell with him anymore. Did God really say, quit standing in the center of his will and come with me? Well, Christ was revealed to destroy that so that people can be with him the way we were made to be. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin. We talked about what it means to be born of God last week. If you are one who has been born again of him, born from above, born anew, born of the Spirit, then you're hitting the mark. He is not able to sin because he's been born of God. Uh Uh-oh, well, I'm certainly able to sin. You guys ever seen uh, Gordon Ramsay, Chef Gordon Ramsay? You ever seen him eat a bologna sandwich on white bread? I haven't. Have you ever seen him eat a bologna sandwich on white bread? What do you think Gordon Ramsay would do if he went into one of these restaurants and they brought him out a bologna sandwich on white bread, a little mayo? Maybe a pickle. I don't think he'd eat it. Do you think he'd eat it? I can't imagine. Lindsay says probably. I don't think. He might take one bite and then do one of his famous tempers and flip over the table and throw it and start cussing at the guy behind the counter. Because he knows the difference between good food and bad food. And sorry, Hayden, who loves bologna sandwich and white bread. That's just not good food. I mean, it barely qualifies as a food substance, let's just be honest real quick. Although, tasty, maybe, it barely qualifies as a food substance. And if you're going to present that to a guy who knows what a New York strip steak should be prepared like, and who knows how to make a lobster, and who can make all kinds of bisques and and various uh, uh, types of sauces and have them come out perfectly, if you're going to say, yeah, here's what you should eat, bologna sandwich on white bread, he's going to know right away something is wrong, and he's not going to want to have anything to do with it. Understand? that's what this is saying if you are one who dwells with Christ who knows what it's like to be in intimacy with Christ who knows what it's like to have his life inside of you you just can't step away from that you just can't not have that and when you are presented with the option to step away from dwelling with Christ to take advantage of the scum of the world you just can't do it I mean, maybe you try once or twice, and oh my gosh, it's just horrendous, and you've got to get back with Christ. This is what he's telling us. He's been born of God. He's not born of the world, and being in the world is tremendously uncomfortable, and it tastes like death, and I want to get out of it, and I want to get back to Christ. Do you understand? This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God especially the one who doesn't love his brother and sister. We're going to pick that up from right there next week. It becomes really obvious, but there's one thing I want to back up on and I really want to center on this morning, and it's extremely important to me that we center on this concept as we make sense of the first half of chapter 3. In order to take him at his word, we need to understand this phrase, little children, let no one deceive you. See, Pastor John was preparing to die. He was old at this point, could have been as much as about 100 years old at the writing of this letter. He had been pastoring the churches of Ephesus, kind of as like their district superintendent, if you will, as well as traveling around to multiple churches, various churches of the various regions, preaching to them, speaking to them, encouraging them to continue following Christ. And he knew 
because of his age, that he was nearing the end. Soon, he would be gone. And then who would they listen to? Who would come and speak to them? You can read First, uh, Second John and Third John, and you'll see that there were people out there speaking to them that concerned John because they were telling them to take their eyes off of Christ, no longer take him at his word. And he was so concerned that they would fall for that trap that he centers the middle of chapter 3 on this concept. You can tell if somebody's walking with Christ or not. Don't follow the people who aren't. You can tell because the people who are are taking God at His word and they're loving one another. It's just that simple. So when people come to speak to you, John says with tears in his eyes, make sure that you're following the ones that are taking Him at His word and that are loving one another. If they're doing anything else, I don't care what they tell you. I don't care how many degrees they have to hang on the wall. I don't care how many other churches have accepted them as leaders. If they come with anything else, other than the Word of God and the love of God, then, then just know. As a matter of fact, in 3 John, he says, don't even welcome them into your home, which was like the most horrible thing you could do in the hospitality-based society. Don't even let them in the door. Just get them out of there. This is important to me because I will not be speaking to you too much longer. I'm about done. And somebody else is going to come. And you are going to need to listen very, very carefully. You are going to need to ask them some hard questions. Uh, Pastor Don knows this. But maybe you all don't. As a pastor, I get called by other churches once or twice a year. Isn't that about probably what you experienced once or twice a year? You get called by another church. Hey! we're looking for a preacher. Hey, that's great. I'll see if I know any. And it's, pretty, it's a pretty normal thing. Another DS calls, oh, you want to move off the district? No, as a matter of fact, I don't. It's pretty common. But I don't mind the interview process. And sometimes I'll subject myself to the interview process just because it enriches me. Because there are people who will ask hard questions. How do I feel about six-day creation? What do I think about the role of man and woman in marriage? What do I think about eschatology, about the return of Christ? Oh, I love it. Because I get a chance to really think this through and put my mind back in the Word and tell people, I don't really think anything other than what God has said. And, and, and my system is based, my system of belief is based entirely on the Word. And if there's something else out there, I'm not really all that interested in it. Oh, I'll learn about it. I'll try to see if maybe it connects to his word. And if it doesn't, I'm just not interested. I'm not going that way. I love that. You guys need to be prepared to do that. Let no one deceive you. Did God really say? Hmm. I want to tell you a Sunday school story this morning to wrap up the sermon. It's a Sunday school story based out of 1 Kings chapter 13. I even have cute little cartoons for you this morning. Sunday school story. It's a great story. Well, half of it anyway is a great story. Do you remember that the nation of Israel used to be united and then it split and there was the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah? We've talked about that. And the, the king of the northern kingdom was chosen by God for his zeal. A guy by the name of Jeroboam was king up there. And he started off real strong, doing everything God told him to do. But then he kind of ventured away. You see, there was only one temple, and it was in Jerusalem, in Judah. And his people from Israel were going down there to worship God. And he was afraid he would lose political strength as a result of the people crossing the border so often. So he built a new altar in a place called Bethel. He built a new altar. It had a, a calf there that they could sacrifice to. And a big fancy altar, and there he is standing on it. The king's not supposed to lead worship, at least not according to God. But, but, but Jer Jeroboam was doing it. Now understand, Jeroboam was at least middle-aged. 
He was strong and powerful. He had been an army general before being king. He was feared by the nations around him because, I mean, he killed a lot of people and he was really strong and he had a mighty army. He was a big, powerful guy. And when he told the people, stop going to Jerusalem and start coming here, they said, yes, sir, we'll do what you say. Just please don't cut out my fingernails and then kill me when you're done. Except for one guy. There was one guy who we don't know his name. He was simply called a young prophet. Young. He was likely between the ages of 13 and 20. He was a teenager. He was a up-and-coming preacher to some extent. This was like his first time out. Nobody had ever heard of him. We don't even know his name. He left nothing behind. He was small and inconsequential and not even old enough for military service yet. And God said, I want you, young preacher, to go tell Jeroboam that he's an idiot. Can you imagine the amount of courage that it would take to do that? Can you imagine how convinced you would have to be of the word of God to do that? He was convinced that God put this message on his heart. And so he left Judah where he was from, and he went up to Bethel in Israel, where Jeroboam was in the act of leading false worship to a false god on this false altar. And he said to him, Jeroboam, God has seen what you are doing, and he has judged you for it. And this altar that you're worshiping on today, there will be a son of David, so a king of the other kingdom, that will be born, and he will sacrifice your false priests on this altar. And to prove that it's true, right now the altar is going to split in half, and ashes are going to come bursting out. And that's exactly what happened. That's pretty powerful stuff. But Jeroboam was powerful too, and so he pointed his finger and he said, arrest that man! And when he pointed out his hand, his hand shriveled up, became weak and leprous, and he knew that God was speaking. And he became very frightened. And he said, oh my gosh, I have been a bad, bad boy. And there's only one person there who actually cares about Yahweh God, and so he says to this young prophet, will you pray for me? that I might be forgiven and healed and restored. And the prophet says, well, of course I will. And so he prays for him. God, forgive and heal and restore this man. And of course God does because he is gracious. And then Jeroboam proves that he is not right with God yet because he offers the prophet at that point the chance to come with him back to the palace and receive a great reward, and be paid by him, and eat from his table. You see, in those days, if there was somebody who was religiously powerful, the king wanted to have them nearby so that they would have the favor of God, and they paid these people very well for it. He gives this young guy, this teenager, think about this a minute, he gives this teenager the opportunity to become instantly famous and instantly rich. Come with me, you'll have everything you could ever want and more. But this teenager is so convinced of the word of God and so wants to dwell with God that he says, in in, in this light of this great temptation, he says, absolutely not. Because God told me I am not to eat or drink in this land and that I'm supposed to go home a different way than I came. See you later, rich and famous. See you later, powerful king. See you later, great kingdom. Off I go. Do you like this guy? What do you think of this guy so far? Is he someone who takes God at his word? You bet. We can already tell he's a good guy. So he starts walking toward home. Now, as he walks toward home, there was another guy there whose dad had been a prophet back in the old days, back before the whole split kingdom, back before it was basically illegal to do Yahweh worship up there. This guy had been a prophet, a preacher back in those days. And and, and the guy went home and he told his dad, hey, there's a prophet in the land. This young guy, this teenager came and he took on Jeroboam and, and, and God came and did amazing, mighty things. And this old preacher got excited. And he said, saddle up the donkey, I'm gonna go find him. And he did find him walking home He was taking a rest. He was sitting under an oak tree in the shade in the heat of the day. He was just taking a rest, waiting for the heat to pass, and then he'd keep walking home. And the old guy finds him, and he says, hey, are you the young prophet? 
that just took on Jeroboam and in the power of God won. And Jeroboam, and the young prophet said, that's me. And he said, well, listen, why don't you come home with me, get something to eat and drink and refresh yourself. Now, listen, there's something you need to understand about culture in those days. And we've talked about this before. Two things are going on. First of all, this guy is older. He is to be respected. In our culture, we don't necessarily respect that way. But in that culture, the younger always deferred to the older. And when you've got a guy that's a couple generations older, you do whatever he says. It's just to be expected. He is to be respected as the right one, and you are to be deferring to him. So when this man says, come with me, the proper cultural response is, yes, sir. Another thing you need to understand about this day is that you did not turn down hospitality. I mentioned that just a little bit earlier. If someone offers you hospitality, I mean, it, it's pretty much criminal to say, I'm not going to receive your hospitality. But our teenage preacher says, I'm sorry, sir, I can't. He's very polite. I can't go with you because God has told me I'm not to eat or drink in this land and I'm to go home a different way than I came. Now, here's where the story turns. The old prophet says, I too am a prophet. An angel of God came and spoke to me and told me to come and find you and invite you home for dinner. He deceived him. Why do you suppose the old guy did that? Hmm. Power, maybe? That puts him in a position of power over the most powerful preacher in the land? Maybe a desire for youth again? He remembers when he was a young preacher, all fiery like that. Maybe the notoriety of having this powerful preacher in his home. I don't know. But he deceived him. Did God really say, don't eat or drink in this land and go home a different way? Did he really say that? Because I've heard from God too, and he said something else. Hmm. Galatians 1.8 even if an angel from heaven tells you something different than the gospel you have and know, don't believe them. That's what Paul tells us. This poor young guy didn't have the book of Galatians yet. And so he went with the guy. He deferred. He didn't take God at his word. And he went with the guy. And he went back and they sat down and they're eating dinner. And as they're eating dinner, the word of the Lord comes to this old prophet. Probably been a long time since that happened. The word of the Lord comes to the old prophet. And he says to the young man, because you didn't take me at my word, you will not die in peace. You'll be killed in a foreign land and your body won't be buried with your ancestors. An, an idea that says your days are numbered you have stepped out of the protection of God. Bad things are coming your way. Do you remember the little chart that I had last week? It starts, we listen to him. We love it. We're deep in his word. And then we move into legalism. We start putting parameters around how we listen to his word. And then we move into a liberalism. We reject the whole thing. Did God really say? And what comes next? Collapse. Both the old prophet and the young prophet are pretty freaked out by this. The old prophet says, get out of town in a hurry. Get on my donkey and get going. And the young man loads up and starts heading back home fast as he can, but you can't outrun God. And as he ran as fast as he can, making all kinds of noise through a wilderness, which is a dumb thing to do, he attracts the attention of a lion who mauls and kills him. And he is now dead on the side of the road. The people of the town come back to the old prophet and tell him what happened, and the old prophet became very upset. He said, the old prophet said, it's because he didn't take God at his word. He must have felt really guilty about that because he went and picked the guy up. Interesting enough, his donkey was just fine and the lion wasn't hurt, hurt, eaten or hurting anything. The lion was standing there protecting the corpse. He picked the guy up and he wrapped him up and he took him home and he buried him. And he said, when I die, I want to be buried with this guy. 
What is the application of the story? I've told you that for every New Testament precept, there's an Old Testament picture, and this is the picture for this precept. We take God at his word. And when a teacher comes along and says, well, let's look at this new interpretation. When a teacher comes along and says, I know it says that in the Bible, but it really doesn't mean that. I mean, did God really say that? I mean, I know what it says. I can break down the Greek as well as anyone, but that's not what it, what it means. What's he tell us in Galatians 1.8? Even if it's an angel from heaven, if they're giving you something different than the gospel that you have, don't even listen. Don't let them in. That's what John is telling us this morning. You take God at his word. You take him at his word. I mean, next week we'll get to loving one another, and that's a lot more fun, but this is where it begins. We take him at his word. 